A massive idol group is holding auditions for new members, and Ruby is eager to try her luck. The first stage of the audition is a written application, and the number of applicants is ridiculous. Out of over 130,000 submissions, a thousand or so, including Ruby, managed to pass to the second stage, which is an interview. On average, only about one out of every 13 applicants makes it through. Ruby anxiously awaits hearing back from them. At her middle school, she can't shut up about it. She had waited for this opportunity for two years, and she's excited and hopeful. Her friends are supportive. She is cute, and her dancing is good. Her singing, though, leaves something to be desired, but her friends think she makes up for it in charisma. Ruby holds two secrets close to her heart that she cannot share with anyone. The first is the identity of her mother, Ai, a popular idol and rising star in the media who was tragically killed by a fanatical stalker a decade ago. The second is that she possesses memories from her previous life, and in that life, she was a devoted fan of Ai. Ever since her mother's passing, Ruby has been determined to fulfill her dream of becoming a successful idol, just like I. Ruby's brother Aqua, however, is a more practical person who focuses on his studies. He sees the life of an idol as nothing more than a big fantasy, especially since their salaries aren't as great as most think, their careers usually end before the age of 30, and their daily lives are pretty much public knowledge, with every little thing they do subject to criticism. Her dream of becoming an idol is not only a tall one, but also not very rewarding even if she does make it. Despite this, Ruby won't give up. Since their mother's death, Aqua has grown into a very serious-minded person. It's anyone's guess whether he's even capable of having a good time. He's an apprentice under the director now, but Ruby's pretty sure he's got more going on than what he lets on. Ichigo disappeared after the incident, forcing Miyako into leadership at the agency which wasn't that big of a leap, actually. She'd kind of been running business behind the scenes anyway. Ruby pesters her about creating a new idol group, but it's not as easy as it seems. The odds of achieving what they had with I were absurd to begin with. To expect it to happen again is pure pipe dream. At last, Ruby gets the call with her audition result. It's not what she had hoped for. Miyako tries to comfort her and reminds her that it's a harsh business. A lot goes into these decisions that they've got no control over, and it's never just a question of talent. But the truth is even more brutal this time. Aqua, Ruby's own brother, was the one who called her. He altered his voice and played the part of a recruiting agent. He had secretly withdrawn Ruby from the competition by text message, from her phone, and blocked the real agency's number. The director can't comprehend why Aqua would go to such extreme lengths to shatter his sister's aspirations. Ruby is a stunning girl and has a real shot at making it, but he won't let the tragedy that befell their mother happen to Ruby, and it's preferable that he handles it alone. For better or worse, Ruby is approached on the street by a scout for an underground idol group, and she can't help but feel like it's fate. Miyako and Aqua are both skeptical about this opportunity. Once again, Aqua feels the need to prevent Ruby from pursuing her dream. Miyako understands how he feels, but since taking on the role of raising Ruby as her own daughter, she can't bring herself to stand in the way of her aspirations. And as much as she hates to say it, Ruby may actually have what it takes. Aqua is still hesitant to accept it. He grabs one of the agency's business cards and heads out. He seems to have a plan. Aqua approaches a girl named Lala as a scouting agent for Strawberry Productions and presents her with the agency's card. After gaining her trust, he brings her to the office. Aqua's objective is to get some information about the agency that's headhunting Ruby, the same agency that currently represents Lala. Miyako is surprised by Aqua's unconventional approach, but goes with it. Aqua goes on to tell Lala that Strawberry Productions could probably offer her a better deal but would like to hear about her current conditions to be sure. Lala quickly divulges her contract terms. She reveals what she makes on average per month, which is nothing exciting, and that the general atmosphere there is antagonistic, her included. She blames her own lack of success on favoritism, alleging that the manager is dating one of her colleagues and putting most of his effort into promoting her. There's a lot of talk among the other members about quitting, and the management seems to be constantly scouting for new talent. After Lala leaves, Miyako cautions that they shouldn't take everything she said at face value. 
considering that even in Ai's group there were rumors of favoritism due to her outshining everyone. However, Aqua is not willing to take any chances and won't let Ruby join a group with so much controversy going on. He's determined to do anything to stop Ruby from pursuing this. The next day, Miyako has one final conversation about it with Ruby, warning her again about all the negative aspects of the industry. Ruby remains determined to become an idol like her mother. Miyako then advises her against joining the group she was scouted for, and instead offers her a spot in a new group that her agency will now put together. This will be the agency's first new idol group since B. Komachi disbanded. Ruby signs her new contract and is ecstatic. Aqua seems oddly indifferent. Aqua drops in on the director and sits down to do some work as his apprentice. The director observes Aqua's reaction to his sister becoming an idol with Miyako's agency. And yeah, it's not what he wanted, but at least this way they've got some control of the situation. Aqua edits some footage for the director. His true motivation for staying connected to the entertainment business is to find out who his father is and take revenge. He needs to be in close contact with folks in the industry so he can somehow collect DNA samples. Being an actor would make it easier, but seeing other people perform, he doesn't think he's got the chops for greatness as an actor and feels it's pointless to chase something if you won't be able to stand out. The director attempts, multiple times, to offer Aqua some sage words of encouragement to get him back into acting, but every time he's about to make his profound philosophical point, his mother barges into the room hollering about one thing or another, like his miso soup getting cold. No big loss, it only calls attention to the fact that this is a man in his 40s still living with his mother. Anything he's got to say, no matter how true, is only going to carry so much weight with Aqua. Aqua compares his talent to that of his mother. He fears that if he doesn't possess that same level of skill, he won't succeed as an actor. The director reminds him that he has an exceptional intellect and other skills that his mother didn't have, and that setbacks should not hinder his aspirations. Aqua recalls his mother's last words. She had expressed her vision of him as a successful actor. Just as he's about to speak up, the director's mother interrupts once again. Ruby and Aqua apply to the same high school, one of the few that offers a performing arts track. Curiously, Aqua simply enrolls in their general studies program. As they discuss how their acceptance process went, a red-haired girl walks by. It's Kana, the baking soda girl, who seems just as short as she was a decade before. She recognizes Aqua, who barely recalls her. She's excited that they'll be studying together. That is, until she finds out that he didn't apply for the arts department. Aqua heads to the director's place and Kana follows him, asking him all kinds of questions, even trying to get him to go out with her. She's quite well known, so normal dates are off the table, and she invites him to her place. He agrees to nothing, but lets her tag along to the director's. She inquires about Aqua's acting career, or lack thereof. He believes that his breakout childhood role was a fluke, due to simply being a child with all of his previous incarnations' memories, temperament, and experience that no one knows about, of course. Kana pivots and divulges her current role on Sweet Today, a drama series based on a shoujo manga that Aqua is familiar with. Kana offers to get him a role on the show, but determined to stay behind the scenes, he's quick to tell her he's not interested. That is, until she mentions that a certain Kabudagi Masaya is working on the show. Aqua recalls the painstaking process of trying to unlock one of Ai's phones. She'd had that phone since before her pregnancy, and this was his best lead to find out who his father is. After a grueling four years of brute-forcing the password, he had finally gained access on try 45510. Masaya is one of the old contacts on the phone. Kana is going on about the effeminately gorgeous male lead when Aqua cuts her off to tell her he'll take the role, which leads her to wonder if he plays for the other team. Kana speaks with Masaya over the phone, and he agrees to give Aqua the gig. Back at home, Ruby is ecstatic about her brother's new role. She's also a fan of the manga. She and Miyako decide to watch the series, only to give up on the first episode. The adaptation is atrocious. The acting is terrible. It's just a sad attempt at publicity for the troupe of models they cast. At a karaoke place, Kana goes into more detail. She had been cast to give the production some credibility, 
but among the rest of the quote-unquote actors, she really has to hold back to not draw too much attention to just how talentless the others are. But she wants to make a watchable show at the very least. The writer of the manga had visited the set one day. To say she was disappointed doesn't capture it. Kana witnessed the writer's soul physically leave her body through her cold, hollow eyes. Since their first acting gig together, Kana's learned a lot and grown, emotionally and empathetically, that is. Physically, she's still very small. She's risking her reputation and position in the industry to try to save the production. She then dumps the fact that they're skipping a table read. Oh, and shooting starts tomorrow. While reviewing the script, Aqua is impressed with Kana's ability to take advantage of a competent crew, regardless of the poor crop of talent, to make an approximation of what could be misconstrued as entertainment and not merely long-form advertising for the models. On set the following day, the production team preps for shooting. Aqua is introduced to Masaya, who could possibly be his father. He just needs to find an opening to collect some latent DNA from the guy. During their one rehearsal for his scene, he puts just enough effort into his role as the villain to avoid upstaging anyone or standing out. Even though he repeatedly asserts that he's a mid-level actor at best, genius recognizes genius, and Kana commends his professional approach to the work in general. And working with him, she feels like she has a peer, that she's no longer alone in her struggle trying to make it in an unforgiving industry. Aqua waits in the shadows for an opportunity to collect some discarded cigarette butts for that daddy DNA. He overhears Masaya boasting about how easy it is to exploit Kana since she became a freelancer. He's using her name recognition and talent as an actor to carry the show while criminally underpaying her. It completely dismisses the only thing she hopes to get out of her work, being valued for her abilities. After listening to this disheartening reality, Aqua resolves to act. Kana reminisces about her childhood acting career losing steam. Instead of this show thrusting her back into the spotlight, she's becoming increasingly frustrated by the other actors' poor performances, despite her best efforts to prop them up. When they film Aqua's scene, he deliberately gets under the lead's skin, improvising lines and provoking him. So when the moment comes that he's supposed to hit Aqua, he really wants to hit him. Kana is surprised by his performance. It's setting her up to shine and does justice to her favorite scene from the manga. After the take, the lead apologizes for connecting the punch to Aqua's face, but he brushes it off. It was him who was trying to elicit a real reaction in the first place. Despite going off script, the crew is impressed with the results, and they decide to leave it as it is. Experience the ultimate vehicle combat game ever made, War Thunder. With over 2,000 tanks, planes, helicopters, and ships, engage in dynamic, combined arms PvP battles. Every vehicle is incredibly detailed, down to their individual components, offering a highly immersive combat experience. War Thunder's collection of vehicles spans over 100 years of development, from the 1920s to the present day. Witness the evolution of warfare like never before. What sets War Thunder apart is its groundbreaking damage model. No generic hit points here. Vehicles suffer actual damage to their components and crew. The damage x-ray reveals the devastating consequences of battle. Personally, I recommend diving into the detailed air combat. Hear the immersive sounds. Feel the adrenaline rush as you engage in thrilling dogfights. Play War Thunder now for free on PC, PlayStation, or Xbox. Register using the link below and receive a large free bonus pack when signing up on PC. This includes multiple premium vehicles, a premium account, boosters, and more. Especially for anime fans, War Thunder added three D Dakimakuras. These can be placed anywhere on your tanks and can only be obtained via our link. Don't wait. Join the ranks of War Thunder players and dominate the battlefield. Click the link below to register and start your epic journey. Yoriko, the series mangaka, watches the new and final episode. Her assistants try to console her about the generally poor adaptation. But after finishing the episode, she breaks into tears over Kana and Aqua's performance, which makes her appreciate the adaptation that she had previously given up hope on. Despite most people writing the show off, the reception of the final episode is positive. At the wrap party, Kana is surprised to find out that Aqua is single. While they talk, Yoriko walks over to personally thank Kana for saving the show with her performance. The producer, Masaya, approaches Aqua with the same sentiment. Aqua's clandestine DNA test from his cigarette butts proved that he isn't his father. 
He notes, however, that Aqua looks like I, having worked closely with her in the past. Aqua asks about his relationship with I, and he reveals that he used to recommend restaurants and such where she could meet guys without her agency catching on. This piques Aqua's interest, and he tries to get more details about her relationships. This gives Masia the leverage to ask Aqua to be in a new reality dating show in exchange for information about I. On the twins' first day of school, Kana points out that every student is an entertainer of some sort, which makes Ruby nervous. In class, she meets Minami, a pinup model, and the two quickly become friends. Later, Ruby introduces her to Aqua and asks if he's made any friends. He's a bit defensive, since he hasn't. Ruby goes on to talk about Frill, a multi-talented entertainer who's in her class, and just then she happens to walk by. Aqua is confused about why Ruby's fawning over her and approaches Frill to ask if she'll be friends with his sister. Ruby is floored that she recognizes him from Sweet Today. She also recognizes Minami, but when she turns to her, Ruby becomes super self-conscious. She hasn't yet been in anything to be recognized from. At home, Ruby begs Miyako to help her kickstart her idol career, but she's having trouble scouting other members for the group. She won't poach talent signed to other agencies, and that limits her to complete unknowns or freelancers. Ding. Aqua suggests asking Kana to join. At school, Ruby follows Kana, noting her characteristics that appeal to idol fans. Aqua notices his sister creeping around and tells her to just ask Kana. But Ruby is nervous. They haven't exactly been on the best of terms. Aqua helps out by sending Kana a message to meet up after school. Kana's looking over the social media conversation around the last episode of Sweet Today and gets flustered when she comes across a comment about Aqua's looks. Of course, that's exactly when she receives his text. She immediately gets the wrong idea and is excited, only to be disappointed when she finds Ruby there waiting with Aqua after school. Shelving her pride for the moment, Ruby gets straight to the point and asks Kana to be in an idol group with her. Kana is caught off guard and asks for some time to think it over. Her instinct is to turn down the offer to preserve her career as an actor, though Ruby does remind her of I and she sees her potential. Just as she begins to say no, Aqua gets on one knee and begs her. Despite her best efforts to refuse the proposal, she ends up caving in. Miyako is surprised that he actually got her to agree and warns him to be careful with his antics. Kana wonders if Aqua has another job lined up, and Ruby, clearly ashamed, reveals his role in a new dating show, which they then sit down to watch. His first appearance on the screen leaves them dumbfounded. Aqua's behavior, disposition, the things he says, it's not him at all. Miyako overhears this and reminds them that he is an actor after all. But this reassurance doesn't make Kana feel any better. On set, Aqua meets co-star Yuki, who's equally unenthusiastic about the show. She makes several humbling admissions, including that she's bad at making conversation. But it turns out she was just playing for the cameras, which are always filming. Back home, Ruby berates her brother. She refuses to let anyone she doesn't approve of make moves on him and decides that she must choose one for him herself. Hmm, Yuki would be acceptable. Aqua is not impressed with her judgment of character. The next day, Kana isn't too thrilled about the whole idol thing, while Ruby tries to figure out what they can do to drum up interest and find more members. Miyako tells them that having an online presence is the way to go these days, and luckily for them, Strawberry Productions has loads of experience managing online streamers. She sets up a meeting with Pion, a strength trainer who wears a bird mask in his videos, and in meetings apparently. Kana has doubts, but quickly changes her tune when she finds out that he's the agency's top earner. They brainstorm ideas for their online debut. The first idea is to make a prank video, but the prank would be staged, and contrary to her mother's philosophy, Ruby thinks they should go another, more authentic route. So they decide to make a video where the girls also wear bird masks and perform a calisthenically choreographed dance. If they can last one hour, then they will reveal their faces. The collaboration is way harder than they thought, and they barely make it to the end. But they do, and after the hour is up, the girls remove their masks and try to introduce themselves while gasping for breath. 
when their host asks what their group's name is, Kana lets Ruby choose one on the spot. They are B. Kamachi, named directly after Ai's group. Yuki toys with the idea of quitting on the latest episode of Love Now. The producers love it for the cliffhanger, and their audience eats up the drama. But when the cameras are off, she reveals that she wasn't actually planning on leaving the show, but she wasn't acting either. Those were real feelings, and she was just exaggerating them. Akane, one of her co-stars, takes notes on everything. After another day of filming, some of the cast members plan to go out for dinner. Nobuyuki invites Aqua along, and he begrudgingly accepts. At the restaurant, Aqua notices Akane's awkward tendency to not get very involved, but write everything down. At home, Ruby chews Aqua out for skipping out on their Sunday dinner, and bemoans how staged the quote-unquote reality show is. He explains that the cast often does act genuinely, but sometimes lying about things protects them in their real lives. A love triangle forms on set revolving around Yuki, leaving Akane feeling invisible. Aqua distances himself and stays on the sidelines with Memcho. She's pleased that she's racking up viewers on her YouTube channel, which was her objective. Though she's growing concerned for Akane, who doesn't seem to be doing well, she hasn't been able to find her groove on the show. Later, Akane overhears her manager getting chewed out by her agency's president. Her lack of screen time is an embarrassment, and he accuses them of not taking this opportunity seriously. Her manager wishes she hadn't overheard that. He considers it his job to protect her from that kind of thing, and tries to assure her that he expects nothing more than everything she's already putting into her performance. But she takes what she heard to heart and feels pressured to stand out. At Strawberry Productions, Kana stops Ruby from posting complaints about a drink. If they're going to be idols, then pissing off any potential sponsors is just bad business. A somewhat clueless Ruby doesn't get how they'd even notice. Kana points out that Ruby looks herself up online, doesn't she? And grabs her phone to prove it. She does. She then assures her that companies ego surf their brands as well. They'll see it. On set, Akane feels she needs to get more screen time however she can, and even asks the director for advice. He suggests she could be the bad girl. While Yuki does Akane's nails, Akane admits she feels like she has to make some kind of move to stand out before the show ends. Yuki understands, but is also pretty happy with being front and center on the show, and warns her that she's not going to back down. Later, Akane manages to get Nobuyuki aside to talk but Yuki steps in and almost effortlessly steals him away. Not wanting to fall into obscurity, Akane goes after them and ends up scratching Yuki's face. The crew cuts to address the wound. Akane feels horrible since Yuki has a shoot the next day, but Yuki forgives her and they affirm their respect for one another. Despite making up off-screen, Akane's image online begins to decline and Yuki's fans pile on the hate. Trying to save face, Akane posts an apology, but it backfires. Since people often see an apology as an admission of deliberate wrongdoing, it just makes the onslaught worse. This sends her into a downward spiral, as people in her life start to turn against her. Despite giving her all and working hard for what she's got, nobody online or at school sees or cares. Unable to deal with the harsh criticism and outright cyberbullying, Akane is despondent. She goes out during a typhoon and stops on a bridge. And right when she steps off, she's grabbed by a hooded figure. She cries out and struggles, but it's Aqua there with his arms around her, and she begins to calm. Akane doesn't understand how Aqua came to be there, and just now. He explains that Memcho became concerned with how long she was gone and in such terrible weather, so he went out in the typhoon to find her. Calmed but still emotionally overwhelmed, she cries, as a police officer shows up, questioning what the two are doing up there on a night like this. At Strawberry Productions, Kana and Ruby discuss the online response to Akane's behavior on the show. Kana points out that people tend to attack the person rather than the show when it comes to reality TV. Miyako receives a call requesting her presence at the police station. When she gets there, she praises Aqua for his heroics, but he brushes it off and only points out that, in situations like this, it's important to act quickly. The other cast members show up to support Akane, and Yuki slaps her out of worry before embracing her. 
Somewhat insensitively, Aqua picks that moment to point out that she's got a decision to make about what to do next, including the possibility of her quitting the show. But Akane refuses to toy with the notion, considering all of the work she's put in and the support she's received to get to where she is. The others agree with her decision and express their full support. Aqua heads to the station's press club and leaks the scoop on Akane's suicide attempt. After the news breaks, some of the haters back off, but others are even more incensed. Aqua devises a plan to sway public opinion by creating a behind-the-scenes look at the show. He approaches Memcho, who agrees to help and offers to use her knowledge of social media to help the video spread online. Kengo is on board as well and volunteers to write the music. Yuki suggests using footage recorded by an unmanned camera of her and Akane making up after the face scratch incident, but doesn't know how they would get their hands on it. So Aqua decides to confront the director directly regarding this footage. The director is not inclined. Since they kind of let the hate train steam on around this event, it wouldn't be great for the reality show if suddenly the reality was revealed. But Aqua proceeds to manipulate him into compliance with a guilt trip. The cast gets together and, with a stimulant-fueled effort, put together their video. Shortly after the post goes up, it begins to spread quickly. Akane sees the video at home and tears up. Not only does it paint her in a better light, but it ends up actively promoting the show as well. 